السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار السلام عليك وعلى أختك زينب وعلى أخيك أبا الفضل العباس ما دي brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to verses of love our we first start with sending our deepest condolences to Imam of our time may Allah hasten his reappearance insha'Allah for the shahadat of Imam Muhammad bin Ali al-Jawad an Imam who plays a massive role an Imam who was killed only at 25 years old an Imam who shook the Muslim Ummah at the, the, at the small time that he lived an Imam who spread only love towards the people who hated him and only knowledge to the people who wanted to learn brothers and sisters we are honored to have Sayyid Zafar Abbas with us in the channel um, Sayyidna will give a introduction inshallah of the Imam may Allah peace and blessings be upon him Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi al-Tahirin Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad uh, Our ninth holy Imam Imam Muhammad ibn Ali al-Jawad al-Taqi alayhi salatu salam was born on the 10th of Rajab in 195 in Medina and was made Shaheed on the last day of the al qada in 220 in Baghdad and so as has been mentioned was the Imam with the shortest life uh, in despite the fact that he's the Imam with the shortest life as we will learn inshallah ta'ala he leaves behind uh, not only pieces of wisdom or words of wisdom that were related and relevant to his time but indeed uh, establishes a system and a way and a method in which to uh, serve the community and the followers and the Shia of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa in a time where there will be no access to an Imam. So it starts from our ninth holy Imam, Salamullah's time, and then it builds on obviously in the following Imam until it gets to the time of the Ghaybat and then uh, what transpires after that. But that that process begins with our ninth holy Imam. He uh, of course is born at a time and lives at a time which is a particularly difficult time for followers of Ahlul Bayt for the Sadat, for Aimma despite the fact that of course uh, it's, the, it's the time where Imam alayhi salatu salam, Imam Rida alayhi salam, his father has been brought to uh, Khurasan, to Iran uh, on the invitation of Ma'moon but yet Imam alayhi salam is still in Medina so he's away from his father and all the family are away from Imam Rida and despite the fact that apparently or openly or so it seems that Imam Rida has been given uh, a position of power and authority in the time of Ma'moon there's still this um, oppression towards the family of the Holy Prophet of Islam and particularly 
towards Ayyama alayhi wa salatu salam. So it's a difficult situation that the Imam alayhi salam is in at the beginning of his time. Uh, despite this, he uh, begins his uh, his life in these circumstances. And then, of course, his father, Imam Rida alayhi salatu salam, is made shaheed when he's nine years old. And then he takes on the uh, responsibility of imamat. And when he takes on the responsibility of imamat, it, it begins, uh, then begins the, uh, in, in, a, in a real sense, then begins the show of the talent of the imam salam, or the ability of the imam salam, and the reality of what an imam is about. Because if we look at the broader policy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regard to uh, to Anbiya, to Ayyam to his representatives, then it is the case that even if there's more than one person present at one time, and that's in some cases there's maybe three people, four people who are representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala present at the same time. But if they're in the same place, if they're in the same area, where if they're all in the same city or same area or same place then only one of them will speak and that will be the person who is the imam who has the responsibility of imam at, at that particular time that is the policy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, therefore for example in karbala we see there are three aimma present but only one imam is speaking they don't have the other aimma speaking or offering policy or offering statements or offering guidance until their turn or their time will come until the day of Ashura, only Imam Salam is speaking at the uh, evening after Ashura, then Imam Sajjad speaks as Imam. And Imam Al-Baqir still remains silent. So, this is the policy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that at one time, if there's all these people present, only one of them will be speaking. So, Imam Jawad salam, of course, is present, but he's not speaking. In the time of Imam Rada alayhi salatu salam. When Imam Rada alayhi salatu salam is named Shaheed, then Imam al Jawad alayhi salatu salam will speak, and then when he speaks, he will uh, testify and show the consistency of what Aim alayhi salatu salam are all about. He will reply and respond and uh, take on the challenges as his predecessors, the Aim alayhi salatu salam, before him have done so. And he will do all of that uh, while still uh, at a young, at a, a very young age, which at a, from an apparent point of view, from a lahiri point of view, he's still a child, but he's taking on these challenges of people much older than him, apparently people who are scholars, who are uh, kings, who are taking on, who have been in this field and this area of work for a long time. Uh, and Imam Ali are taking on these challenges. So, inshallah, we'll go on to look at some of the uh, details of Imam Ali Salatu Salam, the circumstances of what transpire um, at that particular moment in time when Imam Ali Salam takes on the responsibility of Imam, and uh, how he deals with those challenges in a, such a way to protect himself, his followers and to lay down the foundations for things to come later on. Sayyidina, um, Imam al didn't have a boy until the age of 46 or 47. So there was a doubt in the imama from, from when Imam al was was, was um, an imam. So of course it must be difficult for Imam al-Jawad becoming an imam at such a young age and people doubting him. So this this uh, this this thing that trembled the the Muslimin at that time is when I think there was a narration where a uh, a person who came was judged, being judged for stealing of the calf there. Can you elaborate? Just a, a small point on that. Yes. So I mean, if we just before we look at that point, I think a very important point. But what you raised regarding Imam Rida alayhi salam being very old when Imam al Jawad alayhi salam was born. I think it's a it's a very beautiful uh, point to to observe because just immediately prior we have Imam al Qadim alayhi salam and Imam al Qadim alayhi salam spends as we know a very well known thing that he spends most of his life in prisons 
um, yet he has 37 children. Despite the fact that he spent most of his time in prison, he still, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still says, I've given him not just a couple, but 37 children. Imam Rada alayhi salam doesn't spend even a day in prison. Yet he has to wait until he's 47 or 48 years of age before Imam Jawad alayhi salam is born. So there's a, I think there's a very important message in this for us, which is that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't even given this choice or this capability to his chosen ones with regards to when they're going to have children. Uh, we have, this is, I think this is an important message because we have this very unfortunate habit in some uh, people within our community where uh, a couple get married and then after a few years, uh, if they haven't had children, then they'll start asking, have they got problems? Is there something wrong with them? X, Y, Z situation, especially the women. Uh, the, the, the poor women are put through all these kind of ordeals and difficulties regarding why they're not having children. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving this message that look, Imam al-Qadim is in prison, yet I still gave him so many children. Imam Rada is not in prison even for a day. So that from a physical point of view, from a, a scientific point of view, there's no uh, impediment in the fact that he shouldn't have, you know, there's no reason for him not to have children other than the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want him to have a child until that point. Yeah. So it's a reminder that this is not in our control or in anybody else's control. Um, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't even give this control to his a'imma alayhi salam, to his chosen ones, then uh, the, for the rest of us is definitely in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's control. And that is an important point to bear in mind. The response from Imam alayhi salam with regards to um, with regards to stealing um, was that uh, the person was brought in the time of Mu'tasim so this is after Ma'mun dies Mu'tasim becomes the Khalifa and uh, the person was brought into a court and was uh, he was said this person has caught stealing and on the basis of that his hand should be cut off and uh, the Had should be uh, pronounced on him but there was a dispute over where the hand should be cut off from so Mu'tasim asked uh, where should the hand be cut off from so one person said the hand should be cut off from the top of the arm and one person said no it should be cut from the elbow and the other person said it should be cut from the yes. wrist so they so he said that's this is fine this is amongst the scholars who said yes. yeah so he said that this is fine, but what's the evidence for cutting it from the arm or from the elbow or from the wrist? And they were not able to present enough evidence or any evidence regarding where it should be cut off from. Other than the fact that in Urf, what is considered hand. So in Urf, in depend, depending on different contexts, from the arm it could be considered hand or from the elbow it could be considered hand, or from the wrist it could be considered hand. Um, and then, finally, after all uh, answers had been ex uh, exhausted, they summoned Imam al-Jawad and they asked him, and he said that the finger should be cut off, uh, and not the, the whole hand. So they, he asked, Mu'tasim asks Imam, what is the evidence for the just the fingers to be cut off and not the whole hand. And the Imam al-Sadhu replies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran says that the masjid, the places of sajda belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the palm of the hand is a, a part of the places of sajda. They belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is another important message that just because somebody is committed a sin, even a sin for which had will be pronounced, doesn't mean that person is now out of the fold of Islam. Doesn't mean that person is now a person who can never come back to the religion of Islam. The, the, uh, this verdict, this ruling from this hukum from the Imam is telling us that yes, this person uh, you know, committed this sin for which had will be pronounced on him. But 
this door still needs to be left open because just because he's he was caught stealing doesn't mean he doesn't pray. Or does doesn't mean that in future he won't pray. Or in future he doesn't have the capability to pray. So uh, it's an important uh, an another important lesson in today's society particularly we're very quick to be judgmental about people mm -hmm. oh this person committed a sin oh now he's coming to the masjid to pray yes just because uh, a person committed a sin doesn't mean that person is now out of the fold of Islam doesn't mean that person is now not entitled to um, you know uh, be considered a Muslim or considered a mu'min or, or a believer or a Shia of Imam um, that is important to ref this point. Uh, this story reminds us not only that it, it needs an imam to sh tell us the interpretation of a particular verse in the Quran. The verse in the Quran was there; everybody knows the verse, but they didn't know the application of, of the verse to this particular well. uh, to, to this uh, to this incident. But also, it shows us that look, when the imam salam wasn't judgmental towards that person. Then how can I be judgmental towards a towards towards a believer? If I say that I'm a follower of the Imam, how can I be judgmental over somebody who uh, that I found out to commit a sin or committed a sin? Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm ordered, and in fiqh we have this rule that we are ordered to consider uh, the the or assume the best intentions of the person. That when if I've uh, seen that person leave and then come back, then I should believe that that person asked for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. If I saw somebody committing a sin, maybe the next day when I saw him at night, he asked for forgiveness. Or if I saw him at night committing a sin, in the morning he asked for forgiveness. I'm ordered to assume and believe that that is the case, even if the person didn't. Mm -hmm. I'm ordered as an individual, as the person who witnessed it, I'm ordered to assume and believe that this person asked for Forgiveness, because that person is still a believer, and the judgments should be left to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, not to not to each other judging people. Exactly, Ahsantum Sayyidna, Ahsantum. Also, we have um, two very special guests, and their voices ring harmony to the ears of Mu'minin daily throughout the globe. Um, our two very dear brothers, um, Abbas. Uh, Tijani and Shabir Tijani, we are very honoured to have you in the channel today. I know, I believe that we you are filming for Muharram already, That's inshallah. Right. Um, you've been doing it for quite some time. Um, what? Um, I know you've been asked this question probably so many times, but what? Just for just for maybe there's youngsters out there who are thinking to take the line of of recitation in the khidmah of Abu Abdullah Hussein. What advice? What what made you start? What where, where was the where was the the emotion first um, touched? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, it's a very good question. Uh, <coughs> I think my advice. Well, I'll start off with our a brief description of when we started and mm -hmm. and the thing that sparked us off um, from a very young age. Uh, this is this is another advice for parents out there. Um, all we heard in the house was the dhikr of the Ahl al-Bayt. Um, my mother was a reciter, like we are, um, and even sort of from the television, radio, you know, whatever. Whenever we were at home, there's always a dhikr of the Ahl al-Bayt, and that's what sparked a passion in us. Uh, I remember when I was two years old, barely able to talk, but I I loved reciting. My mother took me to the ladies' majlis, and she would pick me up and and put me towards the mic, and I'd recite there. Um, and that's how um, I started, and then soon after, Abbas joined me. And since then, we've been reciting since the age of two, three, from that age onwards. And just, yeah, just to follow on from that, I think one of the major things we'd advise both the parents, um, uh, starting off with the parents, is, is that it's very important to instill that love of the Ahlul Bayt within the hearts. Um, just to put this into perspective, um, I'm, I'm blessed to have a, have a, have a daughter uh, named Zahra, and she has a particular nasheed that she absolutely enjoys, um, which is called yours, Ya Zahra. And every time we've set off on a car journey, she refuses to stop crying and, and shouting uh, until that particular nasheed is played. Because she keeps saying, Zawa, 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 until, until it's played. But that shows that the more you... you um, put the nasheeds, put, put the names of the Ahlul Bayt in front of the children, the more you present it to them, the more they're surrounded by it, the more they'll pick up. But equally, from the children's point of view, and 
in particular, we, we look at not only not, not the children, but those that are into the adolescent age. Well, just touching on what Said was saying is is that, you know, if people commit various different sins through the adolescence, that sometimes it can happen um, as they're growing up. It's very important to remember that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is one of the first to forgive. And it's never too late to turn back to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Never too late to turn back and come back to the to the mosques um, and to partake in the in the khidmat in the in the you know the serving uh, of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wassalam. Because in a Western, in a Western society, it's mm. very easy to stray. Absolutely. No. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's very important for 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 the youth to to remember the fact that um, Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, his entire army, majority of them were filled with the youth, the people that went and they gave their lives to Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. Um, and the youths are th- are the ones that have the most energy to to make change. And so, if they have any ideas, I think the elders of the community shouldn't shun them away. Um, try to encourage them to be part of it. But uh, my main advice for particularly the parents is to nurture that love for the Ahlul Bayt and as the youth get older is to nurture that love of the Ahlul Bayt within themselves and to the, and to their kids as well and um, obviously guys you, you can't have your mashur without listening to the youth of the places sure. um, so inshallah we want to I want to start with a, a spoken word poem uh, for this particular uh, segment um, I did the, the title is called Crimson Sky if we start with the Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad Allahumma salli ala I'm not quite asleep, but I'm not quite awake. You see, I've taken my mind to a faraway place, a land upon which 72 bodies lay upon whom the hooves of the horses prey. I look up and see the crimson sky, red upon orange, I see clouds floating by. Looking down at this desperate sight, women and children running from tent satellite, their hearts filled with so much fright, running into the depths of their darkest night. In the eyes of the helpless victims, there is nothing but fear, yet the eyes of the beasts are red with a lust for blood so severe. The air shudders under the strikes of their whip. I see small delicate strands of hair in a tyrant's grip. This is a land that is like no other, where the cries of the men of Hashim have been smothered. I see women crying, some for their brothers, weeping whilst rocking a small cradle. I see a young mother. This is a land about which preachers pray, speakers say, where dreamers lay, where leaders stay, where believers don't betray, where seekers aren't dismayed. This is a land where revolutions start, disillusions part, all solutions are, a land that lives in the loved one's heart. Because this is a land that has seen such grief from which there was no relief, where blood has flown like seas of 72, like no other one will meet whose thirst has prevailed in heat, yet who did not admit any defeat and stood against falsehood and deceit, for whom martyrdom was sweet. These men are those from whom warriors retreat. You see, long ago that die was cast when on that plain everyone stood amassed. History gives us evidence of the contrast between the oppressors and the harassed. When we look at the world today, we see the oppressors still stalking their prey. We see innocent lives being pawns of play. We still see that innocent necks are slayed. Bodies brushed under rugs by bloodied hands, but you see all of this is planned. There is freedom in speech, but to talk of this is banned. We see destruction of the memories of those that stood strong against any evil doing and wrong. We see graves robbed and shrines desecrated, a manifestation of their hatred. The world turns a blind eye and the devil is aided. History speaks for itself, but the truth is debated. But I tell myself, don't be deflated because there's someone out there, someone awaited. This was the reason he was created. A day is coming that was fated and his arrival in all books has been stated. I pray for a day when I can stand without any threat in front of the shrines of Fatima and Zainab and express my upset at the way they were treated by their nation, express my frustration at this aberration. I want to, there is so much that I want to say, but because of the world today, because my body cannot take me to a place with different skies, all I can do is sit on the ground and close my eyes in a state where I'm not quite asleep but I'm not quite awake, so I let my mind wander 
wander away to that far away place. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ahsan, Ahsan Allah, Masalla ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Dear viewers, inshallah, we'll go on a very small break and we'll, back, we'll be back with you shortly. Inshallah, Sayyid will elaborate a bit more on the life of Imam al Jawad. Inshallah, we'll see you in a few moments. Inshallah. Dear viewers, Salaamun Alaikum and welcome back to Verses of Love. Um, we, just before the break, Sayyidina, we obviously went into the basics of um, the life of Imam al-Jawad. But now, um, a question which many, many people um, in this common society right now, many youth who should know the importance of the life of Imam al-Jawad that he lived. Because he lived, he lived a, a very short life. At the day of the 25, most, most, um, most brothers right now at their 20s, 25 years old, they're not familiar with the life of Imam al-Jawad. And obviously they don't know that um, who, 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 who his mother was and who um, he got married to. And there was a debate with, with, um, with um, Al-Ma'moon when he married um, Umm al-Fadl to Imam al-Jawad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yes, so if we look at that, I, th I think that's a, a very good point also for us to um, reflect over. And that is that um, all of us who are watching and including myself uh, who are over the age of 25 um, need to reflect over the Imam Salam's life and look at what did he achieve and then ask myself what have I achieved in my life um, and and that his title um, at taqi and his title Al-Jawad are titles which are very uh, interesting for s the Imam who is the youngest out of all of them and that is that at taqi is the one who has taqwa, the one who is the pious one and it's important because we usually associate uh, taqwa with people who are out you see the masjids are full of people who are out um, perhaps because uh, w we realize when we become old that now we're about to die and therefore we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but when we're young we don't uh, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Imam Amir al salam in a very long narration part of the narration he says that there are certain things which are good but when they come from certain individuals they become better for example he says justice is good but when it comes from the rulers it becomes better Similarly, in that narration, he says that uh, taqwa is good, but when it comes from the young people, it becomes better. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those young people who are conscious of him more than the old people. Um, so Imam al-Sadu Imam is called at taqi to say that taqwa is symbolized in people who are young. In the Imam who is the youngest out of all of the Imam alayhi wa salatu And he's called uh, al-Jawad. Just very briefly, I want to mention the reasoning why they've been mentioned with these titles. Um, with regards to him being at taqi it's mentioned in Ma'anu al-Akhbar of Sheikh al-Saduq, rahmatullah alayh, that uh, he, is called, he was called taqi because he was, uh, because of his ibadat, because of his uh, God consciousness in his life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala symbolized that or made that immortalized in the fact that one day or one night, Ma'moon became very drunk and he uh, came into the house of the Imam alayhi salatu salam and he uh, thought that he had attacked the Imam and killed him and cut him into pieces and he, w he went there with his servant who saw this whole thing happen and then when the and then he came home uh, satisfied with the fact that he had killed the, the Imam alayhi salatu salam in the morning, uh, he saw the Imam salam come out and he was fine. So he said to his, now, now who does he tell? 
that I killed the Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, and I, in such a way that I killed, uh, did pieces of his, made pieces of his body. So he says to the servant, he says, did you see him? Is that Muhammad ibn Ali alayhi salatu wasalam? And the servant says, yes. And he said, did you see what I had done last night? He said, yes. He said, now don't tell anyone about what transpired at night. But the Shaykh Sadduq says that the Imam والسلام, says that this was the reason that he was saved because of being a taqi, because of being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That whosoever is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will save him in his difficulties. With regards to his title Al Jawad, which is a very uh, even more important title, in fact, in some ways, that Al Jawad uh, is the generous one, the one who's generous. Uh, without considering um, his own status. There's a person who's generous who thinks, okay, I'm earning £1,000 a month and then I've spent uh, all my money in order to take care of what I need to take care of and then I've got some money left over and then I gave some money into charity. That's one kind of generous. No, no doubt that is also an important kind of generous. But there's a kind of generous where he doesn't consider or he doesn't worry about his own necessities but he helps other people if somebody comes and asks him he helps other people that person in arabic is called al jawad the one who can he's generous without considering his own situation for imam al salam it was so well known that he used to help people deep deep and despite his own situation that some of the servants who were around him uh, whilst he was in Medina and Imam al-Salam, Imam Radha al-Salam was in Khurasan, uh, forbid him from coming out of the main entrance of the house. They said whenever he comes out of the main entrance of the house, there's people waiting there, and they they ask him, and he gives them. So they told him go from the back entrance of the house or an alternative entrance of the house, so that people who are waiting outside are not you don't meet them. Imam. Jawad والسلام, informs his father Imam Rada of this situation. And he says, No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made you Al Jawad. And therefore, don't pay attention or don't give importance to those people who are telling you don't go from the main entrance of the house. Go from the main entrance of the house and give people and never leave your house except that you have gold and silver with you so that if somebody asks you when you're on the way you're able to give to them provide for them and then he says if somebody from your relatives i from the sadat asks you then you have a greater right over them so make sure that you give them this much and if you give them more then that is up to you but give them at least this much this amount of gold and silver so on and so forth so therefore he because of this uh, attribute of the Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, he was called al jawad so this is another reminder that taqwa god consciousness is for is for the young and jawad being generous is also for the young that uh, this habit of helping people and giving in charity and being generous should be instilled from a young age as soon as a person becomes a, a one who has money which is saved up out of that money which is saved up the person should become uh, go into the habit of giving people sometimes we think we feel overwhelmed we think there's so much poverty in this world there's so many people in need how much can I help somebody? How uh, and these are the tricks of shaitan. Yes, that uh, there's so much poverty, there's so much need, there's so much hunger in this world. If I give ten pounds or twenty pounds, how much difference will that make? So then I say, forget it. I will not give anything. No, even giving that ten pound is w will be good for my akhirat, and it will help that person. And maybe. It will help another person to also give. And if my giving helps that person and then helps another person to give, then I will make it into a society of giving. And right now we are in a society of taking. But we want to make it into, Islam wants us to make it into a society of giving. And that philanthropy 
What happens in this dunya? What do we see? We see people, a person becomes rich, he becomes a millionaire, a billionaire, then he becomes a philanthropist. Right? Bill Gates is now, you know, one of the richest p people in the world, so then he became a philanthropist, he opened the foundation. Islam says, no, don't wait until you become a billionaire or the richest person in the world to become a philanthropist. Everybody can be a philanthropist. Even if, it, even if it means giving £10, that person is a philanthropist. As far as Islam is concerned, that person is one who is helping another person. And that w might be better than the person who is giving £1 million or £1 billion. Why? Because the niyat of that person is better. So it's, it's, this is what Islam uh, wants to teach us, and from the, particularly from the life of the Imam Alayhi Salaam. Now coming to the point with regards to what Ma'moon tries to do. So of course we know this is the policy of Ma'moon that he brought Imam Radha alayhi salam to Khurasan and then he uh, wanted to make the Imam as uh, Wali Ahad as the uh, heir apparent and of course what transpired is well known and then eventually Imam alayhi salam is made Shaheed by Ma'moon. Now when he's made Imam alayhi salam Shaheed now he thinks that I still need to do something in order to prove my credentials or the things, the uh, image that I've built up. So he thinks that Imam al Radha alayhi salam, he was an old person, and that he was an older person, he was in his 40s or 50s. And so I wasn't able to influence him in the way that I wanted. But Imam al Jawad alayhi salam, he's a child. So if I bring him into the court and I make him used to the surroundings, as we were talking that, you know, and children and their particular surroundings, they become used to that surrounding. If I bring him into the court and I make him used to the surroundings of grandeur and glory and wealth and all these things, then he will become influenced by these things. So this is the thinking of Ma'moon behind bringing Imam Jawad salam, from Medina into Khurasan. And then he thinks the best thing is that I will have somebody who's an informant in his house. So he says to his daughter that I want you to be married to Imam al Jawad. When the elders from the Abbasi clan find out, they're very surprised, they're very shocked, they're very annoyed. They say to Ma'moon that uh, there's all these eligible bachelors from our own clan from our Abbasi clan. Why did you choose somebody from Bani Hashim, from uh, Bani Abu Talib, from Imam, from Imamat? And even though he's just a child, Imam Jawad he's nine years old. There's young, there's better looking people, there's wealthier people, there are older people in our own clan. But you left all of them and you picked Muhammad ibn Ali. So Ma'moon says that I can assure you that he is better than all of them. He is greater, he is superior than all of them, than everyone. So they say that, uh, how can it be he's a, just a child? And Ma'mun says that, okay, you bring the best people from your scholars. And I will bring Muhammad and then they can have a debate and you can find out, you will see what I am impressed about. So they bring Yahya bin Aktham. Yahya bin Aktham is Qadi al Qudat, Chief Justice of the Abbasid Court. 70 years old, 75 years old, hugely experienced, hugely experienced, hugely knowledgeable. And Yahya bin Aktham comes and the elders say to Yahya bin Aktham that we've brought you because we think that you're the, the best person for this uh, challenge. And now you have to ask a question that he won't be able to answer, therefore we will be able to call off this marriage. Yahya bin Aktham comes, he sees Imam as a child and he says, I am 70 years old, this is a child. Ma'moon says, ask him, speak to him. So Yahya bin Aktham starts by saying, will you ask me a question or shall I ask you a question? And Imam al replies in the same way that his grandfather Imam Amirul Mu'mineen replied. 
and he says ask me whatever you want to ask me so Yahya bin Aktham in assumes and he thinks that he is asking the most difficult question that he can come up with the time uh, for Hajj is here and that um, those who Hajjaj already reached there those who've been blessed with this journey of and travel of Hajj uh, will know that uh, for the whole time that you're there you're always worried about making a mistake you're always worried that everything that you're doing has to be right mm -hmm. because it's such a grueling experience yeah. Yeah. and that if you if something goes wrong then it's, it's you start counting in sheep yeah. for paying kafara so Yahya bin Aktham also thinks that one of the difficult one of the most difficult uh, uh, matters is the fiqh of Hajj so he says let me ask a question regarding Hajj so he says that what is the kafara, what is the ruling for a person who hunted in the state of ihram? Immediately Imam salam replies to him and he says that your question is not evident, it's not clear, it's vague. Imam says you need to tell me whether the person who hunted did he do it in Masjid al-Haram or outside Masjid al-Haram? Was he aware of the ruling that hunting in Ihram is forbidden or not? Was he a free person or was he a servant of another person? Was he Mumayyiz or was he Balik? Was he an adult or not? Was he one who had hunted for the first time or was he a repeat offender? <laughs> was he hunting a bird or was he hunting a four-legged animal? Was it a large animal or was it a small animal? Did he repent? Did he ask for forgiveness or not? Did he hunt in the daytime? Or did he hunt at night? Was he the muhrim? Was he in the state of ihram for umrah tamattu? Or for hajj tamattu? Yahya bin Aktham is left silent. Ma'moon says that. Why don't you reply? Then Ma'moon says to Imam that would you give us the answers for these questions that you've raised? Imam al -Salam replies, he says that if it was a bird, a large bird, and it was outside Masjid al-Haram, then he has to pay a sheep in kafara. If he killed it inside the haram, then he has to pay two sheep for kafara. If it is a small bird outside haram, then it is a lamb, a small lamb, which is kafara. He says if the same bird is inside the haram then it is a lamb and the price and the value of that bird if he is hunted a donkey then the compensation is a cow the kafar is a cow if it's an ostrich that he hunted then the compensation is a camel the of the zib of the camel if it's a deer that he hunted then the compensation is sheep if one of the animals is inside the haram then the compensation will be, the kafara will be doubled. If the muhrim is in hajj, hajj tamattu, if the ihram is of hajj tamattu, then he has to bring the animal to mina and slaughter it there. If it's umrah tamattu, then he can slaughter it anywhere, but if it's hajj tamattu, he has to bring it to mina. If the, com if, the, if the person knew or he didn't know, the kafara is the same. However, if the person intentionally did it, then it is a sin. But if he unintentionally did it, he will not. He will still have to do kafara, but it will not be a sin. The compensation, the kafara of someone who is free, will be paid by himself. But the kafara of the one who is a servant will be paid by his owner. If the 
person who did the hunting was Mumayyiz but he wasn't Baligh then there is no Kafara on him but if he is Baligh then the Kafara is on him if the one repents if he asks for forgiveness then there is no punishment in the hereafter but if he doesn't repent then there is punishment in addition to Kafara there is punishment in the hereafter now Ma'mun turns to his clan and he says did you see why I said that he is better than all of the people that you would bring me and then he Ma'mun says now why don't you ask Yahya bin Aktham a question now this is a very it's a fantastic question that Imam Ali Salam asks and he says that a man looks at a woman early in the morning before the time of Fajr and that look is haram then after Fajr he looks at uh, the look is halal then at Dhuhr he looks at her and it's haram again after Maghrib he looks at her and it in the afternoon at Asr he, she, he looks at her and she's halal for him at Maghrib he looks at her and she's haram then at night after Isha he looks at her and she's halal again at midnight she's haram and then at Fajr the next day she's halal again so he says who is the man who is the woman and how is this halal and haram possible Yahya bin Aktham says I don't know you better know the answer Imam salam says that the woman who's we're referring to in this hypothetical example is a female slave early in the morning she belonged to somebody else and a non-mahram the man looking at her is non-mahram to her at the time of Fajr he purchases her and she becomes halal for him at Zuhur he sets her free so she becomes haram again at Maghrib, at uh, Asr, he does nikah with her and then she becomes halal again. At Maghrib, he does zihar. Zihar is an old pre-Islamic custom which is mentioned in the Holy Quran as abrogated that uh, a person when he would become angry with his wife he would say, you are like my mother in the pre-Islamic time and then he would go away from her. Islam came and said that this practice is un-Islamic but if you say that you're like my mother that woman will not become like your mother and if you say that you would have to give kafara you would have to give compensation so he says he does zihar at time of maghrib then he becomes haram and then he gives the kafara at the time of isha so she becomes halal again at the time of Midnight he divorces her, he does talaq and therefore she becomes haram again. And then in the morning he does ruju, talaq al re revocable divorce. So he revo revokes the divorce and he goes back to the time of fajr the next day and then he becomes halal again. The reason for mentioning this, so now he, Ma'mun is beaming obviously with, his, with the pride and he turns to the quote all the people present there and he says to them who can answer questions like this is there anybody here like he or amongst you who can answer questions like this this answer this hypothetical that the Imam alayhi salam has mentioned what he's done is he's taken 24 hours in the day so he's gone from Fajr the first day to Fajr the next day and he's explained the whole bab a whole chapter of fiqh the potential relationships that a man who's not mahram and a woman who are not mahram for each other what are the relationships that they can have obviously it's, this is not a real life scenario it's a hypothetical example but what he's done is he's mentioned all the potential relationships that a man and woman who are not mahram for each other can have and the rulings that are associated with each of them so he, he's and he's done it this 24 hour that makes it easy for a person to relate to 
all these rulings. If you just if you just make a list of these rulings, it will be difficult for a person to remember. But by doing it in this way, he's allowed people to learn this rule and each of the rules and relationships by uh, using this 24-hour clock. So it's it's an invitation again, an invitation for us to reflect that sometimes. You know, all of us who've done exams will know we all had our ways of remembering things for exams. And Imam Al-Sadat Salam has done this, used this way in order to allow and help people to remember these ahkam. So, uh, it's an insight into the way, into the brilliance of the Imam Al-Sadat at this young age, for this reason. Obviously, as, as a result of this, the... Uh, marriage takes place, it happens in the court of Ma'moon. Imam al salam recites the khutbah and the nikah himself. Uh, and you'll be familiar that when we have marriages in our own community, we refer to this khutbah of Imam al-Jawad before doing the nikah. And uh, the reason why it's famous, this khutbah of Imam al-Jawad is famous, is because it's the only marriage of an imam which took place in the court, in the, in the presence of many people. So lots of people recorded that Imam al recited this khutbah, recited this nikah, did this and the nikah, and then he, what he offered as the mahar, which is a very important thing, are some of the du'as that are mentioned in the margin of Mafatih al Janan for various different uh, days of the week and various different times of the day. Uh, which was, uh, in addition to the financial mahar, these are the du'as that Imam Al-Salam gave as mahar to Umm Al-Fadr. The marriage is, a, is very rocky, if you like. Uh, Umm Al-Fadr keeps on writing to complain to his uh, father that Imam Al-Salam has kept me in this ordinary house in Medina and so on and so forth. And she complains to the Imam as well. And the Imam says to her, that I can give you all the wealth and riches that I have. But it's on the condition that you then leave and go back to your father's house. If you want to live with me, then you have to live in this situation, in this state, and in this, in this circumstance that I live in. Ma'moon writes back to Umm al-Fadl and he says, I've put you in that house for a purpose. I don't want you writing to me and, and complaining. The reason I've put you in the house is because I want to know what's going on in the house. Who's, who's coming in that house? Who's leaving that house? Who's meeting the Imam? What is he saying? How much money is he giving? Is he giving them weapons? So on and so forth. Why? Because when a person is in the wrong, when a person is, has done something wrong, when a person has a guilty conscience, then they become paranoid. And this is a, a, a pattern that you'll see. That the, especially with the Abbasi rulers, that they are paranoid. They think at every time everyone is out to get them and to kill them and finish them and take over their kingdom. Imam al has no interest in taking over the kingdom but he's paranoid. Ma'moon is paranoid that Imam al is going to do something. He's going to uh, 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 compile an army. He's going to uh, uh, rise up against me. He's collecting money in order to create a revolution. Imam has no intentions of doing this but he's paranoid. And this paranoia arises from people who know that this seat that I'm occupying, it doesn't belong to me. I have no legitimacy, neither divine legitimacy, nor popular legitimacy, nor do the people like me, nor does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, think that I'm deserving for this position, nor do I know myself that I'm deserving of this position, but I can't leave this position. And so I'm paranoid that somebody else is going to come and take this position away from me. I said to say that. Shabir, um, inshallah, we're waiting to hear your beautiful voice and um, enlighten us with your beautiful poetry, inshallah. The next poem I want to recite, inshallah, is remembering the walk to Karbala, and also I'll give you a bit of background about <coughs> this um, this poem. The, about three or four years ago when, y I don't know if you remember, it was around the holiday time and millions, 25, 30 million people went to Karbala. Everyone I knew, family, friends, they'd all gone. And, um, and I didn't get the chance to go because of circumstances. So in my desperate plight, in my, in, in my heightened emotional state, um, 
uh, myself and Abbas wrote this poem um, as a way of trying to express our emotions for this. It's called I'll Come Crawling to You, Hussein. Um, and if we start with the salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Every day it cuts me inside. I'm so very far from your side. I would give away these eyes just to catch a glimpse of your shrine. If I have to cross the seas. And every desert in between, I will come crawling to you, Hussein. I will come crawling to you, Hussein. They can cut my arms and my legs. They can take everything that I have. I will come crawling to you, I can tell you that I'm insane in the love of my master Hussein. In this universe, there's no pain that can ever keep me away. Every inch that I come your way, every beat of my heart will say, I will come crawling to you, Hussein. I will come crawling to you, Hussein. You just have to look at this world. See, your lovers are tortured and hurt. They can use their tanks and their guns. We will stand together as one. They can tear us limb from limb, but our souls will save from within. I will come crawling to you, Hussein. I will come crawling to you, Hussein. They can put a gun to my head. And they can threaten to shoot me dead. They can wound me till I'm red. They can try to kill me and yet with my every remaining breath, with every ounce of strength I possess, I will come crawling to you, Hussein. I will come crawling to you, Hussein. And inshallah, we pray that when we are at the final stages of our life. They say that when you get to your final stage, every remaining or every memory you have flies in front of your eyes. And it's also said that the Ahlul Bayt visit you mm -hmm. if you've been a true believer, a true follower. So we pray that they say, when you breathe your last, you recall your entire past. When my, when my life, life flashes, flashes past, past so fast, fast I pray I that in my final gasp, death, death will be, be the sweetest taste. When, when I, I see your radiant face, I will I come crawling to you, Hussein. I will come crawling to you, Hussein. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Ahsantum, ahsantum, ahsantum. As you know, dear viewers, we have gone through the life of Imam al-Jawad and heard beautiful poems from the dear brothers. And we know that 
Imam al-Jawad, same as any ma'soom from the line of Amir al-Mu'mineen, have died mazloom. Imam al-Jawad lived a very difficult life. He died at a very young age. He proved amongst the court that even the youngest person of the lineage of Rasulullah can shake any person down with their knowledge. So they couldn't take it. Take it. So Imam al was sitting at home al mu'tasim ordered Umm al-Fadl to bring the harshest poison and to put it Into Imam al Jawad. This poison started to spread throughout the body of Imam al Jawad. She left the home and locked the door. It is said that Imam al Jawad laid on the roof of the house. And when his soul departed this life, he stayed on the rooftop for three days. I remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of another story we hear that Imam al Hussein. We say, oh Imam al Jawad, you had your son to come and bury you, to give you a burial, to give you a kafan. Imam al Hussein was left on the desert of Karbala without a burial. He was left in the desert of Karbala without his head. His children were taken. His children most were killed. أستغفر الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون إلهي We ask you by the غربة of أبي عبد الله الحسين to take back anyone who is lonely, to give patience to anyone who is lonely. Ya Allah, I ask you by the Shabab of Imam al Jawad, if anyone has wishes, Allah grant it for him. And inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By the Imams to keep us on this path of this khidmah, inshallah, ya Allah. Dear brothers and sisters, we thank you for giving us your time to watch this. And we also thank a Sayyid Zafar Abbas with, 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 with enlightening us with this knowledge that many of us didn't know. And we also thank the dear two brothers for sharing their beautiful vo uh, voices and poetry. Inshallah, till next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.